Hello everyone. Today, we're going to talk about how genes express themselves. So, let's jump right in. In the first video of this series, we talked about the structure of DNA. Then we talked about how DNA replicates and how cells divide. Now we're going to answer the question of how genes synthesize their products, such as the proteins that we use every day. These gene products and their functions are what determines, alongside and by interacting with environmental factors, the observable characteristics that we see in us and every other organism. The long chain of processes from gene to gene product is called gene expression, the bridge between genotype and phenotype. Proteins are the most familiar type of gene products, but how did scientists determine this connection? In 1902, British physician Archibald Edward Garrod was the first to propose that genes determine phenotypes by producing enzymes that are involved in biochemical reactions within the cell. He observed that metabolic disorders run in families, which he referred to as inborn errors of metabolism. This led him to the idea that they were caused by the inability to produce functional enzymes and that this inability was inherited. However, the exact biochemistry nor the enzymes that were involved in these disorders were known at the time. The validation of Garrod's ideas came from the work of two other researchers, George Wells Beadle and Edward Tatum, who performed a series of mutational experiments in the 1940s using the common bread mold Neurospora crassa. The mutants they generated needed to be provided with the amino acid arginine in order to grow, unlike the wild type. This meant that the mutations broke one or more enzymes specific for the biosynthesis of arginine. The results of these experiments led Beetle and Tatum to propose that specific genes code for specific enzymes the one-gene-one-enzyme hypothesis. Experiments on these mutant colonies were continued by Adrian Serb and Norman Harold Horowitz. They determined that the mutant colonies fell within three different classes with specific growth requirements. Serb and Horowitz concluded that each mutant class lacked the enzyme needed for one specific step in the biosynthetic pathway to arginine. And because each mutant colony was probably mutated in only one specific gene, it meant that there is one gene for each enzyme, which supported the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. This work was a major landmark for studying gene expression, although since then we have discovered many exceptions to this one gene, one enzyme rule. There are of course genes that produce non-enzymatic proteins, and there are genes that produce the subunits of proteins. Sometimes one gene can produce different proteins. There are many exceptions, but let's first cover the basics of gene expression by using a gene that produces one protein as an example. Gene expression from DNA to protein doesn't occur directly. First, an RNA molecule is synthesized in a DNA-directed manner, meaning the nucleotide sequence of this RNA molecule is determined by the DNA sequence in the gene. Remember that RNA also contains the same nucleotides as DNA, with the exception of thymine, which in RNA corresponds to uracil. Using the single letter abbreviations from a DNA sequence of A, C, G, and T, an RNA sequence of A, C, G, and U is produced. So the sequence is almost the same, but slightly different. Describing this in linguistic terms, these figurative letters in DNA are rewritten in a different form of the same figurative language in RNA. This is why this process of DNA-directed RNA synthesis is more commonly called transcription, and the RNA molecule is called a transcript. In this case, the transcript is also called a messenger RNA, or mRNA, since it carries the message, i.e. the sequence of the nucleotides from DNA to the next step, RNA-directed protein synthesis. But first, you need to know what proteins are. A single protein molecule is a polypeptide, a type of polymer that is made of monomers called amino acids, which are molecules that have an amine group, a carboxyl group, and an R group. This R group varies between different amino acids, for which there are 20 in total, at least the ones that are relevant here. 
To form a polypeptide, amino acids connect to each other at the amine and carboxyl groups by forming peptide bonds, which constitute the backbone of the polypeptide chain. On the other hand, the R group of each amino acid sticks freely outward from the chain, which is why the R group is also referred to as the side chain. Proteins have a sequence of amino acid side chains in the same way DNA and RNA have sequences of nucleotides. And just like with nucleotides, the amino acid sequences of proteins are also often abbreviated with one or three letters. The properties of proteins are determined by the amino acid sequences, which in turn is determined by the nucleotide sequence of the mRNA during protein synthesis. However, there is a problem here. Remember that there are 20 different amino acids and there are only four different nucleotides in RNA. How does the cell use just four variables in one molecule to determine 20 variables in another? If each nucleotide specified one amino acid, RNA could only determine four amino acids. This means the conversion from RNA to protein cannot be as simple as DNA to RNA. So the solution to this problem is solved by having a sequence of multiple nucleotides specify each amino acid. A set of two nucleotides has 16 different arrangements. This is still not enough to determine all 20 amino acids. By using sets of three nucleotides gives 64 different arrangements, which is more than enough to specify all of the 20 amino acids. And indeed, a consecutive series of non-overlapping sets of three nucleotides, or triplets, is what determines the amino acid sequence. Again, using linguistic terms, the figurative three-letter words, the triplets, in mRNA are translated into one of the 20 figurative letters of a different figurative language in proteins. This is why RNA-directed protein synthesis is commonly known as translation. It is also the reason why the relationship between the RNA triplets and their corresponding amino acids is referred to as the genetic code, and why the 64 triplets are also called codons. But what is the genetic code that organisms use? Which codon codes for what amino acid? Marshall Nuremberg was the first to figure out which amino acid was encoded by a specific codon in 1961. By the mid-1960s, all 64 codons were deciphered, the genetic code was complete. It turns out that one codon is a start signal, specifying the first amino acid of the polypeptide chain, and three codons are stop signals that terminate protein synthesis. But still, there are 60 other codons that specify 19 other amino acids, which means that the genetic code is degenerate. There are multiple codons that specify for the same amino acids, sometimes six in the case of leucine and only two in the case of phenylalanine. And there are interesting patterns of this genetic code. The redundancy of the genetic code lies in the third nucleotide of the codons. If you change the first or second letter of the codon, the new codon will always specify a different amino acid. But with the third, this doesn't always happen. There are also interesting patterns regarding the first two letters. The first letter of the codon is correlated with the biosynthetic origin of the amino acid they code for. For example, every codon that begins with T codes for amino acids that are derived from pyruvate. The second letter is correlated with the properties of the amino acid. For example, all codons with T as the second letter code for hydrophobic amino acids. If it is A, it codes for hydrophilic amino acids. Such peculiarities of the genetic code give us some clues about its origins. Although here I am showing the standard version of the genetic code, there are some slight variations between different organisms, but it is nearly universal and the patterns still mostly hold nonetheless. Now that we have covered the basics of transcription and translation, we can look at these processes in more detail. Transcription follows three steps, initiation, elongation, and termination. For initiation, a sequence in DNA called a promoter is needed. It marks the place where an enzyme called RNA polymerase starts the process of transcription. But here there are some differences between the domains of life. In bacteria, the RNA polymerase binds to the promoter with the aid of a single protein called the sigma factor, which recognizes two sets of six nucleotide sequences that define bacterial promoters. These are called the minus 10 or PribNow box, and minus 35 sequence elements. 
named after their location further upstream relative to the transcription initiation site plus one. The sequence of these elements are very similar, but not identical in every promoter. On the other hand, promoters in eukaryotes and archaea are also variable, but they have different promoter elements, one in particular called Tata box. Furthermore, transcription initiation requires a collection of proteins called transcription factors. First, some transcription factors recognize and bind to the promoter elements like the Tata box. This is followed by the inclusion of an RNA polymerase, as well as several other transcription factors forming the transcription initiation complex. Next comes elongation, which works pretty much the same in all domains. RNA polymerase unwinds the two strands of DNA and begins to join RNA nucleotides complementary to the DNA template strand in the 5' to 3' direction. As the RNA polymerase moves downstream of the template strand, it unwinds the DNA double helix ahead of itself and behind it, the newly formed RNA strand dissociates from the template strand and the DNA strands rejoin. The non-template strand is also called the coding strand as its sequence corresponds directly to that of the RNA transcript because both are complementary to the template strand. And finally, there is transcription termination. In bacteria, the RNA polymerase continues until it transcribes the terminator sequence. Most commonly, the transcribed terminator in RNA is an inverted repeat, which results in the formation of a hairpin loop structure by base pairing. The formation of this structure causes the RNA polymerase to detach from the DNA template, thereby terminating transcription. Sometimes, termination in bacteria is done by a row factor, which recognizes a row utilization site, or RUT, in the transcribed RNA. In eukaryotes, the termination sequence is called a polyadenylation signal. When this sequence is transcribed in RNA, it is recognized by certain proteins that cut the transcript at a place further downstream, releasing it from the RNA polymerase. Now we come to the next process, translation. Here we need to note another important difference. Eukaryotes have a nucleus which separates the process of transcription inside the nucleus from translation outside of it. Because prokaryotes lack this compartmentalization, they are able to translate the mRNA even while it is being transcribed by molecular complexes called ribosomes. Whereas in eukaryotes, the direct product of transcription, called the pre-mRNA, undergoes RNA processing before it leaves the nucleus. At the 5' end, a modified guanine structure, called a 5' cap, is added, and at the 3' end, an enzyme adds a whole bunch of adenine nucleotides, forming a poly-A tail. These two structures protect the mRNA from degradation and facilitate its export from the nucleus. Furthermore, most genes of eukaryotes and their RNA transcripts contain segments of long stretches of nucleotides that are not translated into proteins, called introns. These are interspersed between segments that are translated into proteins, called exons. Exons often correlate to functional regions of the protein, called domains. But before translation can proceed, these introns have to be spliced out, which is done by a molecular complex called spliceosomes. Now we end up with the mature mRNA, which is translated into protein by ribosomes just like in prokaryotes. Ribosomes recruit transfer RNAs, or tRNA, which carry the amino acid building blocks for the polypeptide. tRNAs also contain anticodons that are complementary to one specific codon on the mRNA. The amino acids are attached to the transfer RNAs with the proper anticodons by an enzyme. First, the small subunit of the ribosome attaches onto the 5' end of the mRNA. The ribosome only begins to synthesize a polypeptide at a start codon sequence, typically AUG. This defines the reading frame, meaning the ribosome will treat every consecutive triplet as a codon. When a starting codon is encountered, an initiator tRNA with the corresponding anticodon binds onto the start codon. Then, the large ribosomal subunit joins, forming the translation initiation complex. Next, another transfer RNA enters in the A site of the ribosome where its anticodon pairs with the subsequent codon on the mRNA. 
the ribosome catalyzes a peptide bond between the amino acids, releasing it from the previous transfer RNA in the P site and attaching it onto the new transfer RNA in the A site. Like a conveyor belt, the mRNA moves in the direction of the 5' end, taking the tRNA from the A site to the P site, and the tRNA that released its amino acid previously is moved into the E site where it exits from the ribosome. This conveyor belt-like movement of the mRNA also exposes the next codon to be translated in the A site. Another tRNA enters and the same process repeats itself, each time making the polypeptide one amino acid longer, which sticks out the exit tunnel of the P site. This cycle continues on until a stop codon enters the A site, which attracts a release factor that doesn't add a new amino acid to the polypeptide, and also releases it from the last tRNA. Translation is completed. Remember that prokaryotes can translate the mRNA while it is being transcribed. Both prokaryotes and eukaryotes can transcribe a single mRNA strand multiple times with many ribosomes forming a string on the mRNA. Such a string of ribosomes are called polyribosomes or polysomes, which greatly increases the speed and efficiency of the translation. Now we end up with polypeptides, but translation alone often doesn't produce the functional protein. Its amino acid sequence, also called the primary structure, has been determined from translation. Via interaction between the side chains of these amino acids, the polypeptide folds into a three-dimensional secondary, tertiary, and sometimes quaternary structure if multiple polypeptide chains are involved. This protein folding may be facilitated by other proteins called chaperones to ensure the proper folding of a functional protein. Additional modification may be required for it to form a mature protein, such as chemically modifying some amino acids or removing them entirely. It's also important to note that many proteins must end up in specific parts of the cell for them to work. For this, proteins contain signal peptides that direct their transport to these locations. So, we have finally covered the process of how the sequence information from DNA goes to RNA and how it goes from RNA to protein. Together with the self-replication of DNA, this one directional chain of DNA makes RNA and RNA makes protein is referred to as the central dogma of molecular biology by Francis Crick. However, we now know that it doesn't always happen universally. RNA molecules can be transcribed back into DNA by reverse transcription. RNA can also be self-replicated with the use of an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Furthermore, RNA transcription doesn't always lead to the production of proteins. Sometimes the RNA transcript itself is the end product. These aren't called mRNA because they don't act as a message for the ribosomes. They are non-coding RNA, which perform many different functions. We have even seen some of them here, such as the transfer RNA, which are encoded by tRNA genes. And the active parts of ribosomes are in fact RNA molecules, which are catalysts just like enzymes. But RNA catalysts are called ribozymes. The fact that RNA molecules are able to self-replicate and store information, like DNA, and act as catalysts, like proteins, and even make both DNA and proteins, is why researchers in abiogenesis suspect that life began in an RNA world. Though, perhaps life did not start with RNA molecules as the first biochemical components. The Metabolism First camp has something to say about that. So that was gene expression, a wonderfully complex and stupendously elaborate chain or process that is very difficult to memorize in detail, but now you know where to look if you forget something about it. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.